spoke a word you were singing over me. stand for the opening prayer. I'm sorry, closing prayer. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we are so blessed because you are our Father, our Creator, our Sustainer, and our Redeemer. Thank you for this day of rest. A, a, a day where we could just come, fellowship with you, meditate upon your Holy Word, and sing praises and give glory to your holy and righteous name. 
Thank you for the Sabbath School program. We were blessed. We pray that you would be with um, the teacher as he teaches the lesson study. Give him wisdom from above. May we learn about you, your love, and your soon coming by his teaching. Lord in heaven, we pray that you would be with the remaining um, program that is going to be taking place. We pray that you would be with everyone. We pray for the participants that you would bless them. Thank you again for all that you have done and given to us. Keep us loyal and faithful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning and a very happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Those who are present here in the sanctuary and also to all those who are joining our uh, live broadcast. I would like to welcome each and every one of you for our lesson st uh, study this uh, Sabbath morning. The lesson is entitled, Jesus, the Anchor of Our Soul. Jesus, the Anchor of Soul. And the memory verse is found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. And it says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both secure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And before uh, we get into the lesson, uh, let us bow our heads in prayer. Our kind, loving, gracious Father, we are so thankful to you for this time where we could study your holy word. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will bless us with your Holy Spirit, the same spirit that has inspired the many authors of the Bible, so that we may be able to understand the lesson you have in store for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, we have reached almost uh, to the half of this quarter, and we have been studying the ministry of Jesus Christ as our high priest. But this week, uh, this study has been interrupted. And that is because Apostle Paul is giving the people who are listening to him or who are reading his, this letter to the Hebrews, he is giving them a warning. In fact, today's study is going to be divided in two parts. First is the warning part, and the second is the encouragement. What is the warning? And I have listed some uh, points here from the lesson as the warning part. A danger of falling away, something that we call as drifting or going away from, from Christ, spiritual immaturity, discouragement in our Christian journey to the extent, to the extent that we apostatize or even go to the extent of open rebellion against God. The second part is the encouragement part. And Apostle Paul gives us the encouragement that Jesus is the only way of our, for our salvation. He is the hope. He is our high priest. And because he has entered into uh, because he has ascended to heaven and he is seated on the right hand side of the Father, we have access 
directly to God, the Father. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it such a beautiful um, thing to know that Christ, as our elder brother, as we have been studying in the past, has been seated on the right-hand side of God? How would it be if you knew the right hand of the President of the United States of America, if you had a very close relationship with him? What would be the status of your mind? What would your life be? You know? And that is what our Christian uh, journey is all about. It's a very weird comparison. But we have direct access to the most powerful being on this, in this whole universe. And that is what we are going to study. The promise and hope given to the children of Israel is extended to us, is given to us. Assurance we can have, as we study the lesson, we can have, a, we can have assurance, hope, peace, victory, and salvation. Now, mind you, throughout this uh, lesson, Apostle Paul is always having the, uh, the wilderness experience of the children of Israel in mind. He's comparing to the, this experience that the children of Israel had, those who lost their way, those who did not make it to the promised land. And because of the choices they made, God wanted all of them to enter into the heavenly king, uh, into the promised land that is Canaan. And that same principle applies to us. The choices that you and I make are going to decide whether we will be found in the eternal kingdom. Sunday's portion um, is entitled Tasting the Goodness of Word. And I want somebody to read uh, from the book of Hebrews, and if we have the mics, that will uh, save us some time and uh, help those who are watching on our live broadcast to also be able to hear uh, the verses that are going to be read. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And I wish, you know, I could uh, uh, flip this lesson. If somebody has that? Here. Yeah. For as touching those who were once enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. So what do we notice here? What are the key points that are, um, that are talked about in these two verses? First of all, it's talking about people who were enlightened. Then... They had tasted heavenly gift. They were partakers of the Holy Spirit. Tasted the word of God. And finally, we, uh, the text talks about power of age to come. That is, the miracles God performs uh, in the present and will be performing those miracles in future. Now, as I said, Paul is always having the uh, wilderness experience as he, uh, you know, writes to uh, the people here uh, uh, in the book of Hebrews. And uh, as I said, I would like to flip the lesson. The lesson tells us is, uh, what the lesson tells us towards the end of uh, Sunday's portion is, Paul probably had in mind the wilderness generation who experienced the grace of God and his salvation. So what is the experience that they had? We have uh, Pastor Michael putting up his hand. What is the experience that the children of Israel had in the, in the wilderness? I, I want to go back a bit yes. to the uh, memory text where it says Christ has already entered the whale. He's already within the whale. Right. Many people uh, pose a theological question to us. 
because we say in 1844, Christ entered the most holy, passed through the whale. Absolutely. But in this text, it says he already entered the whale. The answer to this is found a few chapters later in Hebrews 9.3. Paul is talking about not just one whale, it is mentioning about the second whale. So when it says whale, we need to determine which whale it was. There is something called the second whale as well. There were two whales in the sanctuary. The first whale to enter into the holy place, and then the second whale into the most holy place. So we believe he entered the whale in Hebrews 9, 6, sorry, 6, 19, 20, is the first whale. First whale, okay. And in 1844, he entered the second whale. Right. All right, thank you for that uh, uh, insight about the two whales. And uh, going back to the lesson um, about tasting the goodness of, of the word. Now, here we see the children of Israel had uh, visibly seen the power of God in their deliverance from Egypt, from, the, from their bondage of Egyptian rulers. For 400 years, they were under the, their bondage. And we find that God sends Moses to deliver them. And in this act, we see that through Moses, God performed many, many miracles. And these miracles were witnessed by the people. Not only that, as they proceeded and came to the Red Sea, they realized that Pharaoh and his army were in hot pursuit. And they started complaining against Moses. But they saw the Red Sea being parted. And as they proceeded, they had the pillar of fire during the night and the pillar of cloud during the day that was constantly there with them. They had received the heavenly food. They had received manna every day in the morning. And in spite of that, we see they were filled with disbelief. Now, going back to the, the first portion of uh, the lesson, which says that people who have been enlightened, what is the meaning of being enlightened? What do you understand? When the verse talked about being enlightened, what do you understand? Being inspired. Being inspired. What else comes to your mind? Conversion. Conversion. Well, being enlightened is uh, being converted, new God, understood the salvation story, which is an act of God. And this is something that a person who is come from the darkness into the marvelous light experiences. Not only that, they also experience the, or tasted the heavenly gift. They were partakers of the Holy Spirit. What does, the, what does the term partakers of the Holy Spirit tell you? What does the Holy Spirit do to us? It helps us to understand. What else? Enables us to have a new birth. To have a new birth. And that's exactly what had happened to these people. They had experienced the new birth. They had come to know God. They had experienced the new birth. And they had tasted the word of God. And yet, they were in danger of falling away, of drifting away. 
And so, if they were in the danger of drifting away, after their conversion experience, after uh, tasting the word of God, Today, you and I also are in the same danger. In fact, towards the end of the lesson, we have a question here. It says, what has been your own experience with the things that these verses in Hebrews have, asked, uh, have talked about? For instance, how have you experienced the enlightening, enlightening that the text refers to? So, if the children of Israel after seeing the power of God drifted away, if the people who were uh, listening or reading the letter to the Hebrews were in the danger of drifting away, what about you and me? Impossible to restore is uh, Monday's portion. And uh, I want someone to uh, read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 4 and 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 6. Is there somebody who can read that? One minute. Can you wait for the mic, please? So that the people who are watching on live broadcast also can uh, hear. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So does this uh, title mean that it is impossible for us to be restored back to a uh, loving relationship to our Creator? Once we have experienced, once we are converted, and you drift away, is that the end of our hope, of our Christian journey? Yes, Pastor Michael. This falling away or drift, drifting away, it is not a one-time incident. Uh, because David, definitely King David fits this category. He was enlightened. He tasted the gifts of the Spirit. Right. And he fell. A righteous man falleth seven times, but he riseth up. So drifting or falling, it means backsliding. David didn't backslide. He fell, but he got up. Peter fell. He got up. But Judas... That was a habit in his life, and he fits this category. All right. So, so we, we have hope. Probably we, we are not in that position where we are completely enlightened, you know, tasting the word. We might be there, but then we still have hope in the Lord as long as we don't turn back. Yes, and it's no co coincidence that we are studying this lesson today, and we have... Uh, our uh, communion service plan for today, you know, many times we hear people saying, I'm not worthy of it. I don't think so. I'm prepared. But that's exactly what the lesson is uh, telling us, that as long as you have the prompting of the Holy Spirit to ask the question, am I worthy? You know, is the fact that you are still connected, the connection is still there. And so, the, 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 uh, the heading does not imply that there is no hope. There is no chance of being uh, restored to a loving uh, relationship uh, with your creator. Now, uh, it is not, the text, the, 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 uh, the title does not imply that it is impossible for us to be forgiven. Because, as uh, Pastor M uh, Michael had pointed out, Jesus has entered not only the first veil, now, that is in 1844, has entered the second veil. And he has 
He is seated on the right hand side. So he is actively involved in, the, in, his, uh, in his role as the high priest, as an advocate, as our mediator. So we are not without hope. There is every possibility that we are uh, forgiven. When we confess, we will be forgiven. But if we turn away from the mediation of Jesus, from his sacrifice and the Holy Spirit, then definitely, as uh, the lesson points out, you know, we will be uh, rejecting. And that is what we'll be studying in the, in the next day's uh, portion. Now, the Jewish leaders, the lesson tells about how the Jewish leaders felt that Christ was a threat to them. Why would Christ be a threat to them? What was... Uh, what do you see in the life of Jesus? What did Jesus do? Why would Jesus' life be a threat to them? Can we? Yes, Pastor Mike. <laughs> Looks like it's only Pastor Mike and me in the lesson study. <laughs> yes, light, light is always a threat to darkness. Absolutely. So since they were in darkness and Jesus is the light of the world, it was two opposite things and they didn't like it. Right. Right. And uh, the question I asked was, Jesus' life was a total life of sacrifice. You know, I was reading uh, sister, uh, one of uh, Sister White's books. I can't remember exactly which one. But he lived a life of poverty. And she says that he would share his only meal with a stranger. I mean... To that extent, well, the healing and uh, teaching and all that was um, repeatedly mentioned in all the um, uh, gospel books. But here Sister White points out that he would share his only meal with a stranger. And that kind of life, a sacrificial life, was a threat to those Jewish leaders. And they wanted to silence him for once and for all. So we see here that their way of life was completely contrary to the life of Christ. Similarly, we see that when we are on our Christian journey and there are things that we like to pick and choose, and that will cause us to drift away, surely and definitely will cause us to drift away, to the point where the life of Christ is a threat to us as well because it keeps on pointing to things that we should not be doing. And then slowly, you don't want Jesus in your life anymore. And that is the most dangerous part. But as long as you repent, as long as you ask forgiveness of your sin, there is hope. There is hope. And so those who have this doubt in their mind, am I worthy? Please, I appeal to you, remove that doubt. There is hope for each and every one of us because Jesus is our high priest and is pleading on our behalf. So we have the assurance of our sins being forgiven. No sacrifice of sins left. That is uh, uh, Tuesday's portion. And um, again, these two uh, titles have been uh, interlinked or are similar. And so um, the title suggests here no sacrifice of for sins left. Uh, this does not refer to a person who has come into the truth by accepting the gift of salvation and uh, is 
experiencing this new life in Christ. But in spite of that, there is a possibility that he may fall. He may sin. But again, we have Jesus as our advocate through whom we have forgiveness of our sins. Now, I want somebody to read the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 26 to 29. Hebrews 10, 26 through 29. Yes. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much surer punishment suppose ye shall ye be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. All right, so there the lesson talks about three ways the author describes the sin for which there is no forgiveness. So, until now we were seeing that no matter what sin you and I have, you and I have committed, we have the hope, we have the assurance that we will be uh, forgiven of our sins. But there is a sin that, that cannot be forgiven. And... Uh, there are three things the lesson uh, points out for which there is no forgiveness. The first one is, uh, the mention, that is mentioned in the lesson is, trample the Son of God underfoot. What does that mean, to trample the Son of God underfoot? Yes, Pastor Mike. It's a figurative language. All right. You know, we, we are supposed to, it says, blessed are the feet that carry the good tidings. But when the feet goes in the opposite direction, right. you know, we are trampling the gospel, the truth. Absolutely. And uh, uh, in short, uh, trampling son of God underfoot would be total rejection of what Jesus has done for us, or rather, just rejecting Christ. You know, uh, the second point that is mentioned in the verse is profaning the blood of coven covenant. Again, it says rejecting Jesus' sacrifice and outraging the Holy Spirit, responding to God's offer of grace with an insult. Yes, Pastor Mike. Uh, another point is in Daniel chapter 8, it talks about the Antichrist's power. And it uses this phrase. It says it casts down truth to the ground. So it is not just a neglect of truth. It's not just a rejection of truth. But it is attacking the truth. Absolutely. And so someone who knew the truth and rejoiced in the truth, if they take that course... That is dangerous. But someone who does it uh, unknowingly or ignorantly like Paul did, he said, I blasphemed in ignorance and God had mercy. Right. Now, Lucifer had great light and it was hard for God to save him because he sinned in great light. The God offered him forgiveness, but pride took over. Right. Uh, thank you for that, those insights. And... Uh, we see here that the expression insulted the spirit of grace is very powerful. The lesson mentions here uh, that this term stands in stark contrast to the description of the Holy Spirit as the spirit of grace. It implies that the apostate has responded to God's offer of grace with an insult. 
the apostate is in an untenable position. He rejects Jesus, his sacrifice, and the Holy Spirit. So if and when you reject the Holy Spirit, if and when you reject Jesus, his sacrifice, the Holy Spirit, then you are rejecting the very means of uh, very means or the only way or source of receiving forgiveness of your sins. This is a very vulnerable position and there is no sacrifice for sins left then. So as long as you have true repentance and you ask for forgiveness, there is no sin on this earth that cannot be forgiven. Now the Bible has, the Bible has listed a number of uh, patriarchs who were strong and faithful, but they, but they also sinned. What kind of sins? In today's terms, those sins were grievous. Murder. What comes to your, who comes to your mind when we talk about a person who has murdered? Moses? David? What about, what about uh, the story of David? Um, you know, sending Bathsheba's husband to the front line and committing adultery. And that person was called a friend of God, next to the heart of God. So we see here that there is hope, there is assurance for the forgiveness, our, forgiveness of our sins. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven. But the moment we reject Jesus, his sacrifice, here and the Holy Spirit, then we are in danger. We are in danger. Remember, it is the choice that you and I make that is going to land, land us in that position. Well, the children of Israel had the opportunity to choose, but they lacked faith and they acted in disbelief. Similarly, the same principle applies to us and the choice is given to us. God does not force anyone to obey him, to choose to obey him, to follow his instructions and to accept Jesus and his sacrifice. The, the, the choice belongs to us. And ultimately, it, it is the choice that we make is what is going to uh, result in our uh, eternal life or eternal destruction. Yes, Pastor Mike. Our greatest sin is not the sin itself, but rejecting the solution to sin. Right. And that's what Jesus said in uh, John chapter 16. He said, of sin, because you don't believe in me. So rejecting God's offer, that is the crime that we commit against ourselves. Right. Absolutely right. As long as you hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit, you have, you have the hope, you have the assurance. But once you reject the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that small, still voice, then you have uh, uh, rejected or you have landed yourself in a position where we have no more pardon of our sins. When is this portion is entitled Better Things? And I want somebody to get ready to read the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. Now, we are entering into the second part of uh, this week's lesson. And that is the portion where Apostle Paul is encouraging the, the, the people who are listening or reading this book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. We are telling you this, our good friends, because we want you to continue well, 
We are sure that God has saved you and that he will continue to bless you. Verse 10. God is always right and fair. He will not forget all the good things that you have done. You have shown that you love him very much because you have helped the other believers. And you continue to help them as God's servants. But we very much want each of you to continue to trust God to the end. Show that you really want to serve him. Be sure that in the end, you will receive all the good things that you hope for. Verse 12. Then you will not be slow to learn. Instead, you will copy the example of those people who continue to trust God. They continue to be patient when trouble happens to them. People like that receive what God has promised to his people. Yes, so now we see here a shift from warning to encouragement. It's a very beautiful way of encouraging. Um, in today's uh, terms, this would be a very intelligent way of encouraging. He says, you don't have to worry. You don't land in the former category. All these warnings that were given is something that is trying to, that he was trying to make you aware or make us aware. And he says that you don't belong to that category. In fact, he expresses confidence that they will do better. And that's why uh, the lesson uh, uh, for today is entitled Better Things. Paul expresses confidence that the readers have neither fallen away from the sun, nor will they in future. He believes that his audience will receive the warning and produce the appropriate fruits. They are like the earth which is cultivated by God and produces the fruits he, express, uh, he expects. So we find here that Paul is kind of um, not only encouraging them, but telling, that, telling them that they may not even fall in future because of all that they have done until now. Believers show their love towards God's name, that is toward God himself, by their service to the saints. You see, and that he does not simply encourage them. Uh, but he's giving them evidence of what they did after their conversion experience, how they produce good, food, good fruits. The uh, expense offering will be collected at this time. And what were those things that they did? It says, the weightiest evidence of love toward God is not religious acts per se, but acts of love toward fellow human beings, especially those who are disadvantaged. So this is a powerful statement. Now, what does this uh, uh, tell us? The weightiest evidence of love toward God is not religious acts, but acts of love toward fellow human beings. And a little step ahead says, especially those who are disadvantaged. What does that mean? Yes, can somebody throw some light on this uh, particular statement that is uh, in the lesson for us? Interestingly, we see in Scripture whether when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, he said, what must I do to be saved? Right. Uh, Jesus quotes the second table of stone, not the first. And also Paul in Romans 13 is talking about true love. And he's again quoting the second table of stone in uh, Romans 13, uh, you know, 8 to 10. James also talking about keeping the whole law. Right. He quotes two of the second table of stone, not the first. Because it's easier to be religious. Right. Uh, no one really can judge you on that. But to be practical in our religion, as James says, pure religion is this. Again, taking care of the poor, the needy. Right. 
How can we love God whom we have not seen if we don't love our brothers and sisters whom we see? So our love for God is judged by what we do around here. Okay. And so that is why the emphasis is always there. Absolutely. And if you look at the Jewish leaders, they were doing everything right. Yet, John the Baptist ridiculed them. Jesus also criticized them. But they were keeping the Sabbath. Is it wrong? They were giving offerings. Is it wrong? They did everything that was listed according to the law. But yet, they were, they were called out. It's because they emphasized on one aspect of the law, but they neglected the other aspect. And Paul is encouraging them by, by letting them know that they were continuing to do good. It is not that just once you go and help and take care of uh, those in need and that's it. No, Paul says that you have continued to do these things. And he also mentions that you know, we need to continue to do these things. And uh, if you look at uh, Hebrews uh, 6 and the 12th verse, it warns against becoming dull or sluggish, which, characterize, uh, which characterizes those who fail to mature and who are in danger of falling away. Hope is not... Uh, kept alive by intellectual exercise of faith, but by faith expressed in acts of love. What a powerful statement. That our hope can be kept alive by acts of love. That is, we need to continue to do good even until our death. That is what the, um, the lesson is talking about. It's not that once you go and help, once you go visit, the orphanage and do the best you can and that's the uh, that's it no we have to continue to do, to do that so that our faith is kept alive paul wants the readers to imitate those who through faith and patience inherited the promises he already has presented the wilderness generation as a negative example of those who through lack of faith and perseverance, failed to inherit what was promised. So, the examples that he's presenting is Abraham. Who through faith and patience inherited the promise, promises. The list of positive uh, examples is lengthened with the people of faith in Hebrews 11. And in Climaxes with Jesus in Hebrews 12 as the greatest example of faith and patience. So, the Wednesday's portion ends with uh, this uh, question here. What can we learn from the apostle regarding warning and encouraging others? You know, it's very important for us to remember the way that Apostle Paul uh, warns and then uh, encourages uh, Thursday's portion is entitled, Jesus, the anchor of, of the soul. What is an anchor? What is an anchor? Okay, we have just one more minute and we will be winding up. Generally, the anchor is uh, something that helps the, uh, the ship to be anchored or to be held steadfast. But our lesson is talking about Jesus the anchor of, of the soul, where we have Jesus who has entered into the heavenly sanctuary and is seated on the right-hand side of, of, of the Father. And through him, we have the hope, and that is the anchor for our soul. May God bless each and every one of us as we continue to walk on our, in our Christian journey that we may not be, uh, we may not drift away, but we may draw ourselves close to him as long as Jesus, our high priest, is there to intercede for us. Thank you.